Okay, I think we can get started. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, phonetics articulation session of um, LSA 2021. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, our first presentation uh, of this session will be by Caroline Crouch of the University of California, Santa Barbara, co-authored with Argiro Katsika, also from UC Santa Barbara, and Ioana Kituran um, from University of Paris 7. Um, and the title of this presentation is Sonority and Articulatory Timing in Complex Onsets in Georgian. So I will let Caroline take it away. Great, thank you. So screens up and... All right, hopefully y'all can see and hear me. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about sonority and articulatory timing in complex onsets in Georgian. So just a brief outline. Um, I'm going to give you all the really large overarching theoretical question, and then we're going to get into some background on both sonority and articulatory phonology. Um, then we'll situate what we're doing in previous work on Slavic coordination and Georgian with some relevant facts about Georgian phonology. Then, of course, go into methodology and results, both for measures of overlap and the variability within those measures. And then we'll discuss these results um, with an eye to both the perceptually driven hypothesis and a production driven hypothesis and draw some conclusions. So the really large overarching question of this work um, is how do space and time delimit the syllable? And a great language to start looking at when you're interested in how syllables emerge in production um, is Georgian because it has minimal restrictions on onset size and shape among other things. And to answer this question, we're gonna engage with um, two theories of the syllable. So the first, which is more spatial um, in its approach comes from sonority. So we're talking about the SSP and we can sum this up as saying that ordering of degree and location of constrictions in the oronasal cavity um, is associated with syllable structure. On the temporal side in articulatory phonology, which I'll refer to as AP most of the time, um, offers a model of gestural timing that captures syllabic structure. So for sonority, um, we know that sonority is an abstract property of speech sounds, and it's a robust concept for explaining a lot of phonotactic patterns and phonological processes in a wide range of languages. Um, but that physical correlates beyond intensity are elusive. Um, on the articulatory side, it can be crudely correlated with the degree of supralaryngeal constriction, um, but we also have to think about right, the nasal cavity as well. This is where the oral nasal stop distinction comes in. It's not just the occlusion in the oral cavity, but how open the nasal cavity is as well. And we do have a sonority-based definition of the syllable that comes from the sonority sequencing principle, which basically states that syllables have local sonority minima at the edges and a maximum at the nucleus. So you can see um, in the figure on the right that the English word plans is quite well formed from an SSP perspective. And for defining these minima and maxima, we use a sonority hierarchy. Um, I'm presenting one here following Parker 2011 um, that is fairly coarse grained, so we don't include affricates. Um, there's no discussion of voiced versus voiceless obstruents as well. Now, from AP, we're looking at the syllable in a different way. So first of all, the basic phonological primitive is the gesture, not the segment. The gesture is a phonologically relevant event in the vocal tract. Gestures are abstract linguistic tasks that are spatiotemporal in nature, and they're triggered by oscillators or clocks in specific facing relationships. So at the bottom of this slide, what you can see is a gestural score for the word dad, and you can see that there are basically three abstract linguistic tasks that happen in a given track variable space and they occur over a range of time, but this isn't specified for the millisecond, et cetera. So these are still abstract. Um, and as I said, these gestures are triggered by oscillators with phasing relationships and syllable structure emerges, emerges from specific phasing relationships. So there are two primary kinds. The first is in-phase coupling. This is what we see between a simplex onset and a nucleus. Um, so they are in phase, they start at the same time. The other phasing relationship is antiphase coupling. This is what we see between a nucleus and a simplex coda, and they're 180 degrees off, so like this. And this works for simplex onsets and codas. When we get to complex onsets, it's more complex. Um, so what we have is competitive coupling. Um, so we see antiphase coordination between the 
onset constant oscillators. And here at the top, you can see a, a two constant onset. So two consonants are antiphase, and then each consonant is in phase with the nucleus. And as a result of this competitive coupling, what we can see is a C center effect. So here we have a gestural score for the word speed, it has two consonants in the onset. Um, and we can see that there's a rightward shift, rightward here in time, right, um, of the prenuclear consonant, the bilabial stop, and a leftward shift of the initial consonant, which is that alveolar fricative su. And so now they're both equidistant in time, basically from this um, C center, which is marked by the um, unbroken line. And C centering has been found in a range of languages, actually, including Georgian. Um, German, English, Romanian, other languages with complex onsets, um, where we see this rightward and leftward shift. It's also worth pointing out that no rightward shift is found where um, a parse for a CCV sequence is not um, a complex onset with a nucleus, but rather C1 is in fact its own syllable. So in languages like Tashli Berber and Rock and Arabic, we don't see the rightward shift. So this tells us that this can also explain um, we see a difference basically in CCV sequences that have a different syllable parse. And complex codas, we just see a sequence of antiphase relationships. I'm focusing on onsets here, so we'll stick with onsets. Both of these approaches um, do face challenges. So from sonority, we know that there have been many documented onsets that don't really adhere to sonority sequencing principles. We have um, sibilant stop clusters in a wide range of languages that otherwise do have sonority conforming onsets. We have languages like Toshli Berber, where there doesn't really seem to be a sonority restriction on what can be in the nucleus. Um, and then there are languages like Georgian, where there don't appear to be sonority sequencing restrictions on the consonants in the onset. Um, and then in articulatory phonology, a major question is how does this temporal coordination work in larger onsets? So a lot of the previous work has looked at two and maybe three consonant onsets. Um, and so we need to understand more how this coordination works as the onsets get larger. Um, and actually very recently presented work from ISSP last month by Anna Hermes et al shows that the rightward shift um, isn't happening anymore in Georgian when the onset is four consonants or larger. And of course, these onsets are also problematic for sonority, right? Because they're not single rises. There's lots, they're really, um, lots of switchbacks, as it were. So I've alluded to this, but why start with Georgian if we're interested in um, bringing these two approaches together? Well, this is why. Here are some licit onsets in Georgian. The first word, um, the famous seven consonant onset, is one syllable. The other three words are two syllables. So by focusing on Georgian specifically here, we can consider a really wide range of possible syllable shapes. So we can bring the sonor a sonority-based approach and then this AP timing-based approach together and fully control for sonority shape because anything is permitted in Georgian. Um, and then this will allow us to see how these two approaches to the syllable um, are related to one another and form one another and give us an avenue into a better understanding of the phonological representation of the syllable and also how syllables are planned, organized, and executed in production. So the specific research question that I'm presenting on today is how do the sonority shape of a complex onset and the order of place of articulation of the consonants relate to the overlap between them? And why am I focusing on um, overlap here? Because the degree of overlap, so we know this is something that's both language specific and it's also affected by a variety of other factors within the language. So order of place of articulation, um, front to back versus back to front, voicing status of cluster members and manner of articulation. Um, so as you can see, we would expect then that overlap would be something that varies between sonority shapes. And we control for manner here. And when I show you the specific stimuli, I'll explain what I mean by controlling for manner within sonority shape. Now, some specific details about Georgian. This is a Georgian consonant inventory. Um, it's quite pedestrian by Caucasian consonant inventory standards. We have a three-way voicing contrast um, with some adjectives. And that's really sort of the relevant point. Also important is that Georgian has a five vowel system uh, at EOU and no phonological vowel reduction. So unlike a language like Russian, for example, where you have this reduction of vowels away from the tonic syllable. There are also no nucleic consonants. So I will bring these facts back when we talk about um, the overlap results 
And of course, as you've seen, there's really minimal restrictions on onset shapes and sizes. So we approach this question by running an electromagnetic articulography study. Um, we have kinematic data from three speakers. Um, we also collected simultaneous audio data from a microphone about a foot away from the participants. And we attached sensors at three points along the tongue, one on the tongue tip, two on the tongue body, upper and lower lip, upper and lower incisor, and the bridge of the nose and behind each ear. And you can see this picture of me from many years ago demonstrating example sensor placement. These uh, three speakers were given these stimuli. So here's what I mean by controlling for manner. Um, I don't think I have, oh, I might have a laser pointer here. Hopefully people can see it if not. So if we look here at the sonority rises front to back, we have, and we can get more fine grain here than the scale actually. We have a stop rhotic. Um, excellent. So we have a stop rhotic, I've lost it now. Um, a stop nasal, stop lateral. And in the back to front condition for sonority rises, we also have stop nasal, stop rhotic, stop lateral. Um, and this is again true for the other sonority shapes wherever possible. In addition, diagonal cells are mirror images of one another. So um, we'll actually start with the falls because the falls are less common. Um, so for example, we find the fall Rubena. And so we have then in the um, sonority rise front to back condition, Regi. So same consonants, but slipped. Again, wherever possible, there's no velar nasal. Um, so, and then the two liquids are both alveolar, so that does restrict um, what was possible. The stimuli were read eight times, seven by speaker two, um, and this is what was presented to them. The frame on the screen, it was given in Jordan, Georgian orthography. So speaker one, um, who was more, a little bit more of a pilot, used this sentence. And then speakers two and three had this frame sentence. The kinematic data were then semi-automatically labeled using MView. Um, and so the relevant um, temporal landmarks here for us based on velocity criteria are the onset of the gesture overall and its offset, the target, so essentially when the closure is made, the release, and then this time between the target and the release, which I'm calling the constriction. This is also called the plateau, but since um, I'm reusing plateau to describe a snorty shape as well, in order to keep things clear, we're referring to this interval as the constriction. So um, based on this, we did two measures of overlap and to give you a little bit more detail on the labeling, labial consonants were labeled and measured on the lip aperture trajectory, coronal consonants on the tongue tip vertical displacement trajectory, and dorsal consonants on the tongue dorsum vertical displacement trajectory. So that's that second sensor on the tongue body, the furthest back sensor. And based on this labeling and these landmarks, we calculated two measures of overlap duration for the consonant gestures. The first is relative overlap, um, and the second is constriction overlap. And of course, I'll give you the full details in about two slides. We also calculated variability for each measure. So how much does each how much do the values of each measure vary, right, um, depending on an independent variable like sonority shape? Statistically, the overlap data were analyzed using linear mixed effects models in R with the postdoc pairwise comparison, well, postdoc pairwise comparisons done using a home correction, and we included random effects of speaker and word in the model for um, each overlap measure. We also calculated variation for both of these measures using the coefficient of variation, the equation is there, and then um, retrieve significant values for these coefficients of variation using this um, modified SLR team, um, which can be implemented using the CVA quality R package. So our hypotheses, how do we think this is going to shake out? We have two competing hypotheses here for how sonority shape of a complex onset and the order of articulation, order of place of articulation relate to overlap. The first hypothesizes that the timing of consonantal gestures and the complex onset depends on perceptual recoverability. So in this case, we expect plateaus to be less overlapped than falls and rises, and falls and rises to not be meaningfully different because only in plateaus is the first consonant both reliant on the release for identifying information and not being released into a more sonorant segment. Conversely, another hypothesis is that the timing of consonantal gestures and complex onsets depends on a hierarchical effect of increasingly open constrictions. And in this case, we would expect falls to be the least overlapped, plateaus to be the middle case, and then 
rises the most overlap. So the more well-formed from a sonority perspective you are, the more overlapped you'll be. And sort of regardless of which of these turns out to be true, we also hypothesize that front to back clusters will be less overlapped than front to back to front clusters will be less overlapped than front to back clusters, which has been found in previous research on Georgian and other languages. For variance, um, we also expect to see, um, here we expect to see a hierarchical effect. So the more well-formed an onset is from a sonority sequencing perspective, the less variance we'll see. So rises will be the least variable, plateaus in the middle, and falls the most. So what happened? Well, first, for relative overlap here, this is basically when C2 begins relative to C1's target, and you can see how it's calculated here. What I'm showing you is the spectrogram as well as the tongue tip vertical displacement trajectory for C1 in this word, which is ra, and the lip aperture trajectory for C2, which is ba. So this is the word bena produced um, with the preceding word kalma. Um, and here you can see C2 begins well before C1 reaches its target. And we found for this measure that sonority was um, overall significant in the model. And we did find a hierarchical effect. Balls are the most overlapped, plateaus in the middle, and then rises are the least overlapped and each of these pairwise comparisons is significant. We also found an order effect. So back to front clusters are less overlapped than front to back clusters. Um, this replicates earlier findings in Georgian for stop stop clusters and then extends it to a wider range. Um, this result wasn't replicated in a 2019 study by Pugli and Kitteran, um, but that was an imitation task. This is a red task as was the previous um, result. So the discrepancy here could be about the task type. And there was no interaction between sonority and order for this measure. Then we also calculated constriction overlap. So the amount of overlap between the constrictions of the two consonant gestures, this is also called the inner plateau interval. We're avoiding the word plateau here. It's calculated like this. And as you can see, so this is the same production of venom from the same speaker. Between the two dotted lines, as you can see, there's a lot of lag between the two constrictions. And in fact, we did find lag in all clusters. So both orders, all sonority shapes, we see lag between the constrictions. And the only significant comparison in the model at all was between falls and rises. And rises show significantly more lag than falls. There's no order effect. As for variation, we do see a hierarchical effect. So for the coefficient of variation, um, the differences between sonority shapes for relative overlap are significantly different. As you can see, rises are much less variable than plateaus, much less variable than falls. For constriction overlap, again, rises are the least variable. Um, but here, plateaus are actually slightly more variable than falls. And this could be attributed to the fact that we didn't fully control for voicing of C1. So um, those voiceless stops are aspirated. Um, and so this could be because of the voicing or aspiration differences in C1. So for the perceptual recoverability hypothesis, we do see this constriction lag that ensures that C1 is recoverable. So C1 is always gonna get an audible release, but at least in this data, this appears to be a language-wide setting. And so we can't say that this is driven by a specific perceptual concern, specifically by the need for C1 to be recoverable um, when the environment around it means that it might not be without the lag. For a production hypothesis, we do find a hierarchy, but the opposite of what was predicted. So falls are the most overlapped, rises the least. Why? Well. We're proposing that this could be because of vocoid avoidance in falls specifically. So in our data, intrusive vocoids appear in sonority rises when one or more sonorants is in the onset. Um, so we have this open constriction, we have the voicing for the sonorant, you get an intrusive vocoid. And here we want to remember that a schwa can't really represent a phonological vowel in Georgian. So we wouldn't expect there to be a strong need to avoid this in general in the language. So then our question is why don't they appear in sonority falls? which also have this constriction lag and also contain sonorants. Well, because C2 began so much earlier. And here's just an example. So this is the same um, Rubena token. So as you can see, again, C2 starts very early. And here's the same speaker producing Bregi, 
So here, C1 is on the lip aperture trajectory, and you can see that C2 starts way after the release of C1. And you, can, you have this very long vocoid here. This is also true when the sonar is a nasal or a lateral. So we argue that the reason for this could be to prevent intrusive vocoids and falls, because falls are somehow more vulnerable to being misparsed as CBCD. Um, and we're testing this claim um, currently via perception experiments. The variability component of the construction hier constriction hierarchy hypothesis does show the expected direction. So we can say that the more well-formed you are from a spatial or sonority perspective, this is reflected in more stability of that measure across productions. So overall, we argue that sonority sequencing and violations of it can best be understood through looking at articulatory timing patterns. And that at least for Georgian, we need to look at multiple measures of articulatory timing in order to fully understand how the phonotactic system is maintained, and that it needs to be understood in the context of the entire phonological system. And then overall, that syllables emerge from spatial and temporal properties taken together, and that you can't really untangle the two. Thank you. Thanks so much, Caroline, for that great talk. Um, I will open the floor for questions. Um, uh, which can be submitted either by uh, using the raise hand feature um, or in the chat. And then I will call on the questions as they come in. So it looks like we have uh, already uh, one question, uh, which is from Chris Geisler. Um, and uh, I guess I'll say that you can answer it. Um, Actually, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I don't know if Chris is in the session. Would you like to ask this question live? Yes. Okay. So I see your hand. Go ahead. <laughs> hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, hi, Chris Geisler, Yale. Love the work. Very excited to see this, uh, especially in context of the presentation at ISSB you mentioned um, last month. Yeah. What? Um, so you started the talk by with the uh, with the in, the in-phase, anti-phase competitive coupling, which is very standard. And I use that, I think, in those terms too. How do you square like a very spare representation like that with the need for something to be much more context sensitive, like to produce, like to, uh, to get effects like the vocoid avoidance? I would say, by the way, that I'm sympathetic to both of these perspectives, both of these kinds of views. Uh, and I think the vocoid avoidance is an entirely reasonable idea. Yes, so um, that's a good question. That's sort of a, a very large question. So I don't have like a, a pithy answer. Um, but so I think, so what I'm presenting here isn't all of the data. Um, so we, we do have as well, this is my dissertation. So luckily the whole thing didn't fit in 20 minutes. Um, where we are looking at competitive coupling. So do we see the right word, left word shift? Um, and we are seeing it for three consonants. And so I think really the way to relate these two, this very sort of bare bones representation with this very context specific thing is actually to bring the two measures together really consistently. So say, this is what we see for overlap and this is how it depends on the segmental context. And then to take what we learned from that and look at how um, this C centering plays out basically um, in different kinds of onsets and to say, okay, because what we found is evidence for white, right word shift, but it's different between, um, obviously sizes, but then also sonority shapes. So to say that there's a relationship between, um, there is a relationship and it can help us better understand how, um, competitive coupling plays out. So there's been recent work, um, oh, Stavroulas, Soteropoulos, I think, um, saying that we need more dynamic measures of how C-Center works. And so I think this kind of work can help us inform um, better ways of, of understanding how these really sparse coupling graphs um, are instantiated in a variety of languages and a variety of clusters. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, and I look forward to hearing what else we all come up with to, uh, yes, to solve the wait. question. Uh, other questions? Uh, Jason Shaw from Yale. Go ahead. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, nice talk. Um, that was really great. Uh, and the response to oh, Jace, yeah, the response to Chris's question, you know, made perfect sense too. I just had um, one kind of analysis suggestion. Maybe you've already done it. I was just wondering if you'd um, uh, factored in the spatial position of the articulators at the temporal landmarks that you're analyzing into the uh, overlap measures? No, not yet, but that is an excellent suggestion. Yeah, and I think that's the very logical next step. To, to me, what would be most interesting about that is, I, I mean, pro I suspect that there'll be systematic differences in the sonority rise versus sonority fall in the um, distance that the articulator has to travel in order to uh, achieve the target for C2. So um, if that's factored into the analysis, I wonder if differences between sonority rise and sonority fall survive, or if it's just the distance to target that can explain the differences in, in overlap. I think that would be super interesting regardless of how it comes out. Um, but yeah. I'd be very curious to see how it does come out. Definitely. I don't want to speculate on what it would look like without all of the trajectories in front of me, but I think absolutely that is, that could really um, expand what's going on, what we presented here. Yes, and I've made a note of it. All right. Uh, we have time for like at least a couple more questions if there are other questions. Going once, going twice. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Um, and the next talk will begin in three minutes. Thanks very much, Caroline. Thank and you. See everyone uh, soon.
Okay, our second presentation of the session is by Dan Cameron Bergdorf from Cornell, uh, co-authored with Sam Tilson, also from Cornell. And the title is Glides Prioritize Articulation, Vowels Prioritize Acoustics. And I will let Dan take it away. All right, uh, so I'm going to be presenting on some things that I've been working on in conjunction with Sam Tilson, as he just said. Um, the big driving question is what's really going on with glides and their relationship to vowels? There's a lot of things we say about them, right? That glides are just vowels at syllable margins or that they're shorter and more constricted than vowels. Um, but in fact, there haven't been a whole lot of actual phonetic studies of glides. There are some for sure, but not very many, and they don't tell us everything or as much as we would like them to. So Sam and I have been doing some experiments to try to get a more solid grasp on what's going on with glides. Um, and there's a recurring thing that's come up that isn't just about constriction or about syllable position. There seems to be a kind of overarching domain preference that glides are prioritizing the articulatory domain and vowels are prioritizing the acoustic domain. And I'll get to exactly what I mean by that shortly, but first let's just set the scene a little. Um, so there are a lot of ways that glides have been characterized phonologically. Maybe the most obvious is just to posit that there's something different about the constriction, right? Um, they're consonants, so we expect them to be more constricted than vowels. Um, we can do this in a symbolic fashion using features like plus minus consonantal or plus minus syllabic, or we can take a more gestural approach with parameters like stiffness in articulatory phonology. But either way, the prediction is the same, that we should see differences in the constriction degree and therefore in F1. Alternatively, we can posit the glides and vowels differ in place. This isn't as common, but there have been some proposals along these lines over the years. Uh, for instance, that glides might be realized with more extreme targets than vowels, so that palatal glides would be more anterior than front vowels, and dorsal glides would be less anterior than back vowels. There have also been proposals that vowels just have one place feature, dorsal, while glides would get that and another one, palatal for yod, labial for w. The prediction with any of these kinds of things ends up being something about the constriction location, and therefore F2. And then we can say, maybe glides and vowels aren't intrinsically different at all. Maybe it's just structural. It's about where they are on the syllable or how they're coordinated with other gestures. Um, and in that case, we'd expect to see differences in timing effects. And of course, none of these things are mutually exclusive. It could be some combination of them, but this seems to about cover the full range of ways the glides have been characterized phonologically. So the first experiment that I'm going to talk about now was just aimed at collecting some articulatory and acoustic data to test those predictions. Do we actually see differences in constriction and or differences in timing? And also how categorical are those differences? Um, we used electromagnetic articulography and also collected acoustic data. We had two sensors on the tongue, two on the lips and the jaw and reference sensors. Um, and we had six native English speakers who were imitating two sets of stimuli. Um, the stimuli varied in intensity and duration one set from E to yod with ambiguous stimuli in between, and one set from U to W, also with ambiguous stimuli in between. And then all of these high vowels or glides or ambiguous things were put inside an AXA frame. So we had from AIA to AIA, AUA to AWA. And once we had run some participants through this, we looked at a whole slew of variables in their productions. Uh, we looked at constriction, at timing intervals, performance, speed, trajectory smoothness, anything that we thought might possibly be relevant. And we found some evidence of constriction differences in the E versus Yod pair and a lot of evidence of timing differences in both pairs. But what was most interesting to me was actually something that we hadn't been looking for at all. We found that glide-like productions had less variance in many spatial variables than the vowel-like productions did. Uh, so what you're seeing in this figure is on the x-axis of each plot, we have the productions grouped by the duration of the stimulus that the participant was imitating. So short is glide-like, long is vowel-like. Um, we have collapsed across the intensity dimension since participants didn't seem to respond to it very much. And in the, last, in the left panel, we have a bunch of different duration variables. In the right panel, we have some spatial variables. Um, the peak, of course, is related to the constriction degree. We have a release speed and some curvature measures. Um, for each of the variables here, the figure is showing the average variance across participants. So we found each participant's variance in their productions 
took the mean across the group and normalized to a max of one so we could see them all together. Um, and you can see for these durations and spatial variables, we've got the shorter, more glide-like productions having lower variances. So they're being produced more precisely. Um, while the, the variance goes up as the productions become longer and more vowel-like. I should say this doesn't show all of the variables we look like. This is just the ones that had substantial variance effects going on. Uh, the rest of them were basically flat lines, so they're not very interesting and they kind of clutter up the charts. Uh, but as you can see, for some spatial variables, we do have significantly more, significantly more precision with the glides than with the vowels. But when we go and look at the acoustic variables, the formants and intensity, the opposite is true. Now it's the vowels that are more precise. We see the variances going down as productions get longer and more glide-like. So what do we do with this? Because this isn't something that's predicted by any of those phonological models that I just talked about. And to make it even more interesting, some of these variables that are showing strong variance effects did not have a significant effect in the variable itself. So the productions are getting more or less precise without the mean value necessarily changing at all. Um, as surprising as it, as it is though, in a way I think it's almost intuitive. Um, glides are consonants after all, and consonants of course are going to have precise articulatory targets. Just thinking of the way we model things, it's so easy to model consonants with simple, even binary features or with nice, clean gestural parameters. But then when you try to do vowels, everything just gets messier. Um, you don't have the discrete uh, zones of stability that you get with consonants. The vowels are all just kind of splattered across this continuous multidimensional space. So the fact that they have more variance in their spatial variables or their articulatory variables maybe isn't actually surprising. And if vowels aren't constrained by a precise articulatory target the way that consonants are, then why shouldn't they key in on the acoustics instead? But of course, an ad hoc finding from one experiment isn't a whole lot to work with. Um, so Sam and I put together a couple more experiments. And this one, experiment two, was using an altered feedback paradigm. Uh, altered feedback paradigms are experiments where you play back the participant's speech in real time, but you've altered it in some fashion without telling them and they'll change their productions to compensate for that alteration. So if you make F2 higher, they'll drop it lower so that what they hear is more like what they expected to hear. Uh, to my knowledge, spectral alterations like with formants have only previously been done on vowels and fricatives, though there have been several studies doing temporal alterations on other consonants. Uh, but what we did was apply a spectral alteration to both glides and high vowels. We altered the formants to make them sound higher and fronter so that speakers could compensate by making them lower and backer. Um, this seemed like a good way to directly test the hypothesis that vowels are prioritizing the acoustic domain more than glides are. If we subject vowels and glides to the same kind of altered auditory feedback, we should see the vowels compensating for it more than the glides. And after the results of experiment one, we didn't expect E and Yo to have very different formants to begin with. So any difference in how they respond to the spectral alteration is likely to be due to their underlying status as a consonant or a vowel, instead of just because they're starting in different places to begin with. So we had the participants do two blocks, one where they were saying bia with two vowels and one where they were saying bia with a glide. We chose the labial stop so that it wouldn't interfere with the vowel gestures. Uh, and we chose a schwa because we wanted to be certain that speakers would produce the yod as a consonant. Whereas if we had had them saying something like you, a lot of people would argue that in English that's actually a diphthong. And we actually had a few participants who couldn't reliably produce the Bia cluster and we had to exclude them. Um, as for the rest, we asked them at the end of the experiment whether they thought the words you and su rhymed to try to, try to gauge whether you was a diphthong for them. And how they answered didn't seem to have any relation to how they performed during the experiment. As long as they could produce the glide cluster, they were fine. Uh, so they heard audio models of these words first and then they were cued orthographically for the rest of the experiment. Uh, each block had 400 trials, 50 baseline, 50 while the alteration ramped up from nothing to its maximum. It was held there for 200 trials, and then it turned off and the participants had a final 100 trials where they could hear themselves accurately again. And we tried to just target the segment we were interested in, the glide or the high vowel and not the final vowel. So the alteration only lasted 100 milliseconds in each word and then stepped down to nothing as shown in the figure here. <clears throat> But things got a little messy with this experiment. 
In general, our participants didn't seem to be as good at compensating as other studies have found. And even when they did compensate, they didn't always get it right. We had a few people who went in the wrong direction. Uh, we think this is probably because the alteration that we were applying was pushing right up against the edge of the vowel space, whereas more often you'll see people altering mid-vowels so that there's a nice cushion all around them. Um, so being on the edge might have just made it harder because it's formants that the participants aren't used to hearing or to correcting. Um, we also had several participants who produced much longer vowels than we expected so that they outlasted the alteration so that the feedback the participants heard, those participants heard, ended up being some kind of weird diphthongal thing instead of just a higher fronter sounding vocoid like we intended. And those participants um, are on the right side of the dotted line in this plot. And they didn't really compensate for the vowel at all, but they did still compensate for the glide because of course nobody had glides longer than 100 milliseconds. Uh, so they still had the right kind of feedback there. Uh, so those participants had better compensation for the glide than for the vowel. But if we set them aside and just look at the ones who had short enough vowels that they got the right kind of feedback on the vowels and on the glides, the ones to the left of the dotted line in the figure here, then our hypothesis is pretty well borne out. Most of them compensated more for E than for Yod. Uh, several of them also started compensating faster for E than they did for Yod. So the formants for E would start changing almost as soon as the alteration started ramping up, but the formants for Yod might lag 12 or 20 trials behind. <clears throat> We didn't collect any articulatory data in this experiment, but since we had the acoustic data, we also looked to see if it would replicate our earlier finding about acoustic variances, and it did. Uh, we looked at the variances of each participant's formants in various periods in each block, and whether we were looking at baseline trials or while the alteration was active or after it or at any other period, the vowels always had less variance than the glides did. And this was true regardless of how well the participant was compensating. Finally, we have experiment three, which is basically the same as experiment two, except using or looking at U and W instead of E and Yod. Uh, here we went with the coronal consonant, so they're saying dua and dwa, so that we wouldn't have a labial and dorsal consonant potentially interfering with the labial and dorsal gestures for the vocoid. We started this experiment a while ago, and frustratingly, because of the pandemic, we still haven't been able to get enough participants to really have conclusive results. But it's looking promising so far. We are, again, seeing people compensating much more for the vowel than the glide. Um, so if we've got vowels responding more than glides to acoustic feedback, and we've got them showing greater acoustic precision, while glides are showing greater articulatory precision, precision <clears throat> what do we do next? Uh, one obvious thing left to try to fill out this paradigm would be to compare how glides and vowels respond to altered somatosensory feedback but of course, that's another kind of experiment that we can't really do these days. Um, even without that, though, it seems pretty clear that the glides are paying more attention to the articulatory domain and the vowels are paying more attention to the acoustics. And it also seems like a safe bet to generalize glides here to consonants. Um, though, of course, that would also bear some, bear some further study. Um, I'd like to take a look at liquids since they have pretty strong form and structures. So they could, um, you could do a spectral alteration on them the same way we've been doing on glides and vowels. Um, but if we can establish that consonants are more about the articulation and vowels are more about the acoustics, how do we model that? How do we fit it into our phonological theories? Um, I think some theories are better suited than others because if we're just working with features or auto segments or something that's very abstracted away from the actual articulation and acoustics, it's hard to get back to that. But if we're working in a framework like articulatory phonology, we're much more equipped to handle this. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I should thank Caroline for explaining about articulatory phonology so I don't have to myself. Um, of course, articulatory phonology is very rooted in articulation. That's its whole thing. It's right there in the name. Um, but in fact, people are already using acoustic gestures in AP for the purpose of modeling tones. I know this has been done for Mandarin and Thai and probably more languages too. And here's just an example of a gestural score for a nonce word with high tone you'll have a tone gesture or an f naught gesture that's abstracted away from the, lar the laryngeal articulators that are actually making it happen. It's just an acoustic pitch target uh, because that seems to be more meaningful and more useful than getting bogged down in the details of what exactly is going on in the throat to make it happen. We know it's the pitch that matters. Um, and you can also see here the way vowels are often characterized in AP gestural scores either as some kind of tongue body gesture for higher vowels, or in this case, a laryngeal gesture for a low vowel. 
Um, and of course it's true, there are tongue movements associated with any given vowel, um, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't shift the representation away from that a little bit in the same way that we don't focus directly on laryngeal movements that are used for tone. Instead, we can model vowels as using formant gestures or maybe formant ratio gestures where the target is to achieve a ratio between the formants. Um, might seem strange. I, would, I do want to point out that we often talk about consonant gestures versus vowel gestures, like they're two distinct things anyway. Um, we have we have this understanding that consonants and vowels are very different things, even if we can't say why, really. Um, and this could just actually, or this could just be a way to actually meaningfully characterize that difference. Like a tone gesture, a formant gesture would just be realized by whatever articulatory means are appropriate, which is generally going to mean certain kinds of tongue positions, but will also mean that you're freer to compensate for altered acoustic feedback by changing your articulation. And we have that kind of formant gesture for vowels, but glides are still getting a regular consonantal gesture that immediately explains the domain difference between vowels and glides. Um, and then for bia and bia, like we had in our experiment, we would just end up with scores like these where, uh, with F1 and F2 gestures for the vowels instead of pharyngeal gestures or something. As soon as we can collect articulatory data again, I'd love to see if we can find clear evidence in support of this kind of model. But I'm not saying that this has to be how we model things. The takeaway is just this um, recurring theme that glides are prioritizing articulation while vowels are prioritizing the acoustics. I think however we choose to model that, this could be invaluable to our understanding of how consonants and vowels work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan, for that very interesting talk. Um, I will open the floor for questions. Again, you can raise your hand or pose the question in the chat. And it looks like we have a couple questions already. Uh, first from uh, Doug Whalen. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, really interesting stuff. I'm a little puzzled as to why the consonants are getting a, uh, are the glides, which are more consonantal, are presumably also a narrower constriction, and yet you're finding greater acoustic variability. Um, it, it, do you have an explanation for that, or am I just confused? Um, I don't have a direct explanation, but I will say in experiment one, we actually found that the high vowels tended to be more constricted than the glides were. Um, not by very much, but it was statistically significant. So this um, sort of this common idea that we all have that glides are more constricted may not be as accurate as we think it is. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it's uh, perhaps with Emma data rather highly dependent on your uh, the accuracy of your palate trace so mm -hmm. that you know just how constricted things are, but uh, maybe the, the relative height would tell that too. Anyway, very interesting stuff. Thank you. Uh, okay, and then now we have a question from Christopher Geisler again. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, yes, nice work. Um, Chris Geisler, Yale. I, mm, this might be a clarification question because I, may, I don't think I was successfully tracking everything you were saying, but um, I was concerned that since I, I really support the idea of using, you know, looking where the, the structure variate, the structure, looking at the structure variation, I think that's really important. Um, but I'm concerned that a lot of your arguments are relying on um, comparing variances of things that are different durations. So, for example, if for something that's longer, having a lower variance. Uh, would be expected based on just, a, you would think, because they would attain their target and therefore you'd have, they had more time to attain their target, you'd have more measurements with lower um, di distance to the mean. Did you have a mechanism to control for, to compensate for that, for the expected lower variance in just things that were longer? Um, not exactly, Ed. For, for the actual durational measures, you're absolutely right that that's going to be uh, a factor that's very hard to get around. But for most of the spatial measures that I was talking about, we were specifically looking at something at one point in time at a, a location on the trajectory or a speed or something of that nature, or else we were looking at like curvature or smoothness 
over the same period of time. Um, and likewise, when we were taking formant measurements, that was over the same period of time. Okay. Okay. What were those, uh, what, what were some of the, the single points that these spatial positions were taken at? Uh, we looked at the maximum trajectory at target and release, um, maximum velocity into and out of it. Okay. Um, just okay. Yeah. Pretty that makes standard sense. landmarks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I look forward to seeing where this goes and in wrapping my head around a written version of this. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and now we have a question from Jason Shaw. Go ahead, Jason. Can you hear me? Yep. Dan, really interesting ideas. I, I like to talk a lot. Um, my question, um, uh, I mean, so I, I mean, I think it makes the, the proposal makes sense. You know, uh, why, why not have low dimensional acoustic targets as well? Um, like for F0, but I just wanted to go back to um, this kind of like uh, monitoring auditory feedback adjustment um, uh, a, a data and also the Emma data and just toss out another idea. Um, if, it, if it takes time to adjust your articulation in response to um, auditory feedback, could it be that um, say longer sounds are more likely to be adjusted than shorter sounds? I suppose it could be, certainly if you were talking about um, adjustments within a given word, but when you're looking at uh, compensation or adaptation over the course of hundreds of trials, I'm not sure that that would be so much of a factor. It's certainly something worth looking into. I wonder if there's a way to factor it into the analysis mm. um, so that maybe you use uh, um, duration as a covariate, like so that the actual production duration in the, um, in the kind of acoustic, uh, in the auditory perturbation study to see if you, if you factor that in and, and residualize against duration, if you, if you still see the same uh, uh, types of, of responses or if mm -hmm. you know, duration systematically affects that. Absolutely, thank you for suggesting that. But it, anyway, if, if, it, if it has nothing to do with duration, I still think the proposal is interesting. <laughs> so so um, uh, that's a possible alternative analysis, but I think you know, both ways it's interesting. It's cool stuff. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, now we have a question from uh, Holman Zay, uh, which is about this articulatory versus acoustic distinction supporting what has long seemed intuitive. I was wondering uh, if you thought of extending your analysis to diphthongs. No, I hadn't actually. Um, there could be a lot of interesting stuff there. Thank you for the idea. Uh, okay. Other questions? I actually have a question. Um, so I am wondering whether, uh, like, whether you have thoughts about how, uh, in particular, the variance findings that you were talking about relate to kind of um, differences in um, reducibility, or like how much the these segment types glides versus glides per se versus vowels uh, reduce, mm -hmm. uh, especially in like languages with with lexical stress. Um, and then the reason why I'm thinking about this is just, just because like if you think about uh, these segment types in sort of an exemplar framework, you can imagine that maybe vowels just inherently have more um, like articulatory variability associated with them um, as compared to Clyde. So yeah, I was just curious about your thoughts. Um, it definitely makes sense to me there could be a relation to reducibility. I'd actually be curious to try to to try to determine if it's causal one way or the other, or if there's um, it's not immediately clear to me which way it would be. Um, okay, now we have a question from uh, Jay Paget. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, I'm I'm sorry if you mentioned this and I missed it, but I'm wondering if um, you see your results about vowels to be maybe. Um, uh, supportive of uh, quantal theory, and you know, I'm thinking that 
you know, what that theory says about vowels like e and u is that they want to occupy uh, regions of the articulatory space that allow, you know, a lot of variability without acoustic or perceptual variability. Thanks. Uh, again, that's not something I had um, thought about a whole lot, but I do see the connection you're making. Um, and just the, the inherent nature of vowels, you know, all occupying spaces that have more freedom like that compared to consonants. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. That's definitely something worth looking into. No problem. Uh, we have time for uh, like a couple more questions at least, if there are um, other questions from the audience. Uh, okay, let's thank our presenter. Thanks, Dan. Um, our next presentation will start in about four minutes. So see you soon.
Okay, our last talk of this session uh, is by Ryan Bennett of UC Santa Cruz, uh, co-authored with Robert Henderson uh, of the University of Arizona and Megan Harvey, also of the University of Arizona. And the title is Vowel Deletion as Gestural Overlap in Uspantico. I'll let Ryan take it away. Thanks, Charles. Um, so today uh, we'll be talking about um, some phonological patterns in Uspanteco, uh, which is a Guatemalan Mayan language uh, belonging to the Quichan branch of the family. Uh, this language is spoken exclusively in the town of San Miguel Uspantan in the central highlands of Guatemala, as well as um, some surrounding villages by about 1,500 to 4,000 speakers. Um, and unfortunately, Uspanteco is uh, an endangered language as uh, most children in the traditional Uspanteco speaking uh, region of the Central Highlands are now learning uh, Spanish and or closely related Mayan languages like Quiche as their first languages. Uh, so today um, we uh, will be suggesting that there's a pattern of stress sensitive vowel deletion in Uspanteco, which is best understood as being a clear instance of uh, phonologically controlled um, gestural overlap between uh, consonants and vowels as uh, 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 in line with the kinds of analytical assumptions that one finds in uh, articulatory phonology and related frameworks. So uh, to flesh out this claim, uh, first we need to start with some background on uh, stress assignment in Uspanteco. Um, there are two patterns of stress assignment that we find in this language. Uh, the first uh, is what we might think of as the default or majority pattern. This is the pattern that we find in words of most phonological shapes. And this is word final default uh, stress, uh, which can fall on word final short vowels as well as uh, word final long vowels. The second pattern of stress assignment that we find in this language uh, is uh, sensitive to uh, tone. So uh, Uspanteco is fairly unique among Mayan languages in having both stress accent as well as a lexical pitch accent system that involves a contrast between uh, the presence or absence of high tone in certain positions in the word. Uh, and in words where uh, lexical high tone occurs on the penultimate syllable and the final vowel uh, of the word is short, stress retracts from its default position on the final syllable in order to coincide with high tone on the penult, as you can see in uh, these examples here. Now, um, both stress and tone in this language are strictly uh, limited to a word final two syllable window, which in phonological terms, we can fairly directly uh, identify with a word final uh, bisyllabic metrical foot that's firmly anchored uh, at the right edge of the word. So in cases where uh, we have uh, default final stress, this would of course involve iambic footing at the right edge of the word. And in cases where we have uh, uh, penultimate stress conditioned by uh, the presence of a high tone on the penultimate syllable. This would involve what's sometimes called a foot form reversal uh, from iambic footing to trochaic footing, still uh, anchored absolutely at the right edge of the word. Now some uh, evidence for this foot-based analysis of stress assignment in Uspanteco comes from the pattern of syncope, the pattern of vowel deletion that is our primary concern in this presentation. Uh, because uh, the presence or the, the patterning of vowel deletion and the positions targeted by vowel deletion seem to be uh, intimately tied up with the kind of foot structure that we've assumed for stress assignment uh, uh, up to this point. So let me uh, spell that out with some details. Um, in Uspanteco, uh, unstressed short vowels frequently delete, but the position targeted by vowel deletion is selective. So there, there are specific spots within the word where unstressed short vowels uh, undergo rampant deletion and other places in the word where they do not delete quite so easily. Uh, so in particular, when stress is final, we find that the immediately pretonic unstressed short vowel often, although not always undergoes deletion. This is a variable process, uh, uh, which will be important for some of the later discussion in this presentation. So for example, in the word um, she or he plays the marimba, uh, we have some repetitions or renditions or utterances of this item where that pretonic short O is very clearly pronounced. It's audible, it's visible in the um, acoustic record. And then we have many repetitions and utterances of this same item where that pretonic O has been deleted. It's not audible, it's not present in the acoustic record if you inspect the recordings. 
So this is the pattern that we find when we have final stress. The immediately pretonic uh, syllable is selectively targeted for deletion. In cases where we have penultimate stress, the position that's selectively targeted for deletion flip-flops. So instead of targeting the immediately pretonic position, what we find is that deletion selectively targets the post-tonic position, as we can see here in this example for uh, my bean uh, in Kinak, uh, where the post-tonic ah has been deleted in this uh, repetition of this item. So the reason that this pattern of deletion uh, at least seemed uh, to us uh, originally to provide some support for the foot-based analysis of deletion in, in Uspanteco is that foot structure gives us a very nice, clean, simple, descriptive generalization for which positions are selectively targeted by this deletion process. It's those um, unstressed short vowels, which are also in foot internal position, either pretonic when stress is final, as you see on the left, or post-tonic when stress is penultimate, as you see on the right, which are the positions that are selectively targeted by this deletion process. So that's all well and good, um, but there's an aspect of this uh, deletion process which always um, troubled us, which is namely the high degree of variability and optionality that characterizes this process. And, and this has uh, led us to wonder over the years that we've um, conducted fieldwork on this language, whether it's really appropriate to think of um, deletion as being a, a kind of traditional SPE style categorical, symbolic, abstract rule of phonological deletion, or whether we might be uh, dealing with a pattern that is better characterized as involving a high degree of gestural overlap during speech production, um, specifically a gestural overlap between consonants and vowels, which can lead to the impression that a vowel has been uh, deleted when instead that vowel is still present in the phonological representation, it's just been masked or hidden because of a high degree of gestural overlap between that vowel and flanking uh, segments. So to make this a little concrete, for those of you who might not be familiar with this um, particular idea, um, we can draw an analogy with um, some work on uh, word final coronal deletion or TD deletion in English. Um, so as is uh, fairly well known uh, in English, uh, word final consonant clusters, uh, T and D seem to uh, variable, variably delete, um, giving us doublets like west side versus west side uh, with deletion of that T. We might be uh, inclined to treat this as just a regular you know, optional phonological rule, uh, but there are a number of characteristics of this process which might suggest that we're dealing with something that is a little more surface oriented, uh, uh, involving again patterns of gestural overlap between segments rather than uh, this abstract process of deletion as such. So for example, there is the very fact that uh, this is a variable or optional process, which perhaps we might be inclined to identify as a, a typical trait uh, more uh, downstream phonetic processes. Um, there's also the fact that uh, the likelihood of deletion is conditioned by uh, factors which are often construed as extra grammatical in nature, so things like speech rate and style. Um, and there's the fact that the likelihood of deletion is very finely conditioned by um, detailed properties of the segmental environment that the T or the D finds itself in. So we get a, a raised likelihood of deletion after coronals, after obstruents, after stops. We have this very fine-grained sensitivity to place and manner, which um, we might think, again, is maybe more typical of uh, uh, patterns of gestural coordination uh, rather than a, a kind of simplistic deletion process like the one shown in the upper right-hand corner. So um, famously, uh, Broman and Goldstein uh, investigated uh, exactly the question of whether we're dealing with a phonological deletion process here or instead something uh, uh, involving a high degree of gestural overlap between segments um, by looking at a, a database of X-ray uh, microbeam uh, recordings, uh, assessing the movement of the articulators in phrases like perfect memory, uh, where we have a T which is uh, eligible to undergo this uh, process of final TD deletion in English. So what they found is that uh, in careful speech, uh, the T uh, in uh, perfect uh, is produced essentially sequentially uh, with the following M in memory. The gestures for those two consonants are not particularly overlapped. They're pretty well separated. And as a result, when the uh, T is released, that release uh, is uh, audible in the acoustic record. There is no impression whatsoever that deletion has occurred. However, uh, in casual speech, what they found is that the uh, T and M gestures in the phrase perfect memory are substantially uh, overlapped, such that uh, by the time the T has been released, the constriction for the M has already been uh, more or less entirely formed, with the consequence that the release of that T won't be audible. 
because there's a blockage downstream at the lips that will prevent uh, that uh, airflow associated with the release of the T from uh, basically reaching the acoustic record. So this gives the impression to listeners and in recordings that deletion has occurred, but we can see quite clearly here from the articulatory record that T is still present in this um, speaker's motor plan. It has not in fact been deleted, it's just obscured by patterns of gestural coordination. So coming back to Uspanteco, what this might mean is that uh, in cases where uh, vowels which are eligible for uh, deletion are pr uh, actually pronounced and retained, we would have a relatively low degree of overlap between those vowels and flanking consonants. You would be able to hear that vowel. Uh, in cases where it would appear that a vowel has been deleted, we would instead have a high degree of gestural overlap uh, between uh, that vowel and the flanking consonants, giving the impression of deletion even uh, uh, though the vowel itself is still phonologically present. This can be straightforwardly contrasted with a traditional analysis in which we're dealing with a categorical abstract phonological rule, in which case there would uh, be no vowel target whatsoever in the uh, articulatory record. <laughs> so um, we're going to come back in a little bit to uh, actual articulatory data that speaks to this question. Uh, but before getting to that point, I want to lay out um, some traditional diagnostics for uh, categorical abstract phonological patterns on the one hand and more um, surface production oriented uh, phonetic patterns on the other hand and suggest that those uh, traditional di diagnostics are somewhat equivocal as to the phonological versus more phonetic -y status of this process. Um, so to start, uh, we have the observation uh, established earlier that uh, deletion appears to uh, be directly conditioned by abstract foot structure. Um, and to the extent that we think foot structure is really uh, a phonological object, being a kind of abstract phonological constituent, that interaction in and of itself might be suggestive of a phonological process uh, rather than a phonetic process. Um, further, uh, deletion seems to sh uh, show some sensitivity to uh, consonant phonotactics in response to uh, so first, uh, there's a very robust generalization that uh, deletion fails to apply between identical consonants. So for example, in the word um, Cyprus here, Kesis, uh, that underlined E in post-tonic position is eligible for deletion. Many vowels in that uh, position would delete, but uh, that vowel in Cyprus never undergoes deletion, you never get Kes. Um, this kind of effect is well known in the uh, phonology literature. It's sometimes called anti-gemination uh, because it's the blockage of deletion in an environment where deletion would lead to a sequence of adjacent identical consonants or a false geminate. Uh, there's also, uh, there are also phonotactic restrictions uh, which inhibit deletion um, related to certain kinds of clusters containing glottal stop. So deletion is categorically uh, banned in, uh, following a word initial glottal stop. Um, presumably, uh, that's because deletion in this environment would create a word initial glottal stop consonant cluster, which is not otherwise attested in Uspanteco. Uh, and kind of symmetrically, uh, deletion is categorically banned in word final vowel glottal stop sequences, probably for the same reason, uh, namely that deletion in this environment would produce necessarily, uh, given the, the syllable phonotactics of the language, a consonant glottal stop cluster in final position which again is uh, unattested otherwise in Spontecho. Uh, strikingly, uh, deletion is also completely insensitive to speech rate and style as far as we can tell. Um, it occurs uh, in fast and casual speech, but it also regularly uh, occurs in very careful, highly guarded, highly self-monitored formal speech. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, deletion is uh, systematically represented and discussed in highly formal uh, documents like uh, dictionaries and pedagogical grammars, uh, where you might think that you know, a casual speech phenomena would not normally be uh, included or, or described or transcribed, but um, these kinds of documents are just replete with deletion in this language. Um, there's also a, a kind of categorical sensitivity to certain kinds of morphological distinctions. Uh, in particular, vowels and prefixes never undergo deletion, even when they satisfy all of the other uh, uh, conditioning uh, requirements for deletion to occur, as you can see in this example, uh, Shina. Um, this is in sharp contrast to suffixes and roots, where deletion happens all the time. Deletion is completely widespread in suffixes and roots, but it is categorically prohibited from occurring in uh, prefixes. Which again, we this kind of morphological sensitivity, 
we might take as being characteristic of abstract grammatically controlled phonological processes rather than things like um, uh, more phonetically uh, phonetic processes like uh, gestural overlap between uh, segments. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have the uh, observation uh, that syncope is uh, quite variable, both uh, within and across speakers, uh, which we might think is more characteristic of phonetic processes. Um, perhaps more compellingly, there is also the observation that deletion seems to be the extreme endpoint of a process of gradient vowel reduction that occurs in exactly the same uh, positions that we find deletion. So uh, for example, here we have the word flower, uh, kutzich, um, you can see here that there's a vowel E, which is uh, eligible for deletion. It's in the deleting environment in the post-tonic position here. Um, it's somewhat reduced. It's about 60 milliseconds long. Um, what we actually find in this environment more typically is that uh, vowels are extremely shortened and extremely reduced even when pronounced. So here is a more uh, typical rendition of this item where we have E being reduced uh, down to about 20 milliseconds. And then ultimately, if we think of deletion as being the endpoint of this kind of gradient process of vowel shortening or vowel reduction in this position, if we just follow that to its logical endpoint, we get the complete disappearance of the vowel uh, between those consonants. So if we think that reduction itself, for example, involves some degree of increasing encroachment of consonants on that intervening vowel, then we can just think of deletion as what happens when those consonants completely encroach on, those inter on that intervening vowel without leaving any remaining trace. Uh, further, uh, despite the phonotactic sensitivity that uh, deletion shows, it can also produce um, some pretty surprising clusters. So very, very regularly, uh, deletion gives rise to consonant clusters, which are marked both from the perspective of uspanteco, uh, being clusters that do not occur in other environments in the language, um, but also from a typological perspective, because they seem to be completely indifferent to things like sonority sequencing or featural agreement or other patterns of um, uh, uh, consonant cluster phonotactics that are familiar from phonological typology. Um, this uh, suggests uh, a much lower degree of phonotactic sensitivity. Um, furthermore, even those uh, really uh, robust phonotactics that we've already observed, like the in inhibition of deletion between identical consonants, those seem to be near absolute, but not completely absolute. So uh, to illustrate here, we have the word my sugar cane, wahif. This is a vowel that normally would not be eligible for deletion because it's between uh, two identical consonants. But every once in a while, we find exceptions to this. So here we have an utterance of the same stem where deletion actually has applied in this environment, uh, perhaps indicating that phonotactic sensitivity itself uh, though robust, is uh, not quite as categorical as we might have first assumed. So it seems that we, we have uh, some competing arguments for a phonological versus a more phonetic treatment of this process. Um, uh, and so we might uh, ask ourselves whether we can tease these apart uh, more directly by looking at uh, articulatory evidence uh, in the spirit of Broman and Goldstein's study of TD deletion in English. So specifically, we can ask whether there might be any articulatory trace of apparently deleted vowels in uh, 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 the instrumental record, even in cases where if we inspect the acoustic uh, signal, we inspect our uh, uh, acoustic recordings, it seems that the vowel has been lost. So to do this, um, we looked at some electroblatography data that we had independently collected to look at the phonetics of tone in this language. Um, if you're not familiar with electroblatography, it involves placing um, two electrodes on either side of the larynx, running a very weak uh, imperceptible uh, electrical current between those electrodes, and then seeing um, how that electrical current varies depending on uh, whether or not the vocal folds are in contact with each other or apart. So EGG gives us a very direct measure of the presence or absence of uh, voicing in the signal independent of anything that might be happening in uh, the oral portion of the vocal tract, right? We're just directly getting signal from the larynx itself. So um, if vowel deletion really involves gestural overlap, we might hypothesize that voicing associated with the vowel could be detectable via EGG, even when it's not apparent in the audio recording, perhaps as a result of um, supralaryngeal uh, coordination patterns. So uh, we investigated this by looking at some CVC sequences in our EGG data in which the vowel was eligible for deletion and in which both consonants were voiceless. Uh, because in this environment, if we look at derived consonant clusters where both of those consonants are voiceless, but we find voicing in the EGG signal, uh, 
we have to attribute that voicing to the underlying vowel rather than to the consonants themselves. That would be the key uh, indication that that vowel is still articulatorily present despite uh, being absent from the acoustic record. Um, so we looked both at items like this item, uh, uh, where we had a vowel that was eligible for deletion, but which did not seem to delete. And also items like uh, this separate rendition of the same word where it looked like deletion had occurred. Uh, we also compared um, voicing in both of those um, conditions to underlying sequences of uh, adjacent voiceless uh, consonants to give us a baseline for what the EGG signal should look like when no voicing is present. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of um, data to investigate here. We have data from one speaker, uh, including 16 tokens of CBC intervals where deletion did not apply, and 14 tokens where deletion did apply. Um, however, even with this small data set, some uh, really interesting patterns emerge quite clearly, uh, because in the majority of cases where it seems like deletion occurred, when we inspect the audio recording, as you can see here, there's just no trace in the audio recording of a vowel. If we inspect the corresponding EGG signal for that same uh, token, we find evidence of brief periods of weak attenuated voicing corresponding to the underlying vowel. And um, if we kind of pull together this data, as you can see in this plot here, which shows us um, the amplitude of the EGG signal, so the amplitude of voicing across these um, CVC intervals, we can see that this is pretty consistent, right? So the black line shows us uh, the amplitude of voicing in cases where a vowel is present in the audio recording. And the yellow line shows us the amplitude of voicing in cases where a vowel is not identifiable in the acoustic recording itself. Uh, again, confirming this uh, finding or summarizing this finding that we find brief weakened uh, attenuated periods of voicing in the EGG signal, even when vowels are not uh, audible. So um, we think that this provides some uh, confirmatory evidence for the idea that uh, what we might have first thought was a phonological process of deletion really amounts to a high gestural overlap between uh, vowels and flanking consonants. At the same time, we also think that this finding doesn't obviate any of the earlier observations we made about the apparent um, uh, phonological and grammatically controlled uh, nature of this deletion process. So, um, exceptions of sporadic exceptions aside, it's very clear that there are strong sensitivities to um, phonotactic constraints like anti-gemination and a ban on certain clusters containing a glottal stop in certain positions. That looks like a grammatically controlled process. There is still the fact that this appears to be conditioned by foot structure. The fact that we have an absolute categorical asymmetry between deletion and suffixes, which is widespread as well as roots and prefixes where it's uh, prohibited and the fact that there is no conditioning by speech rate or style. Uh, so putting this together, and then I'll stop, um, it's, uh, we would like to suggest that this pattern of deletion amounts to phonologically, grammatically controlled gestural overlap, as um, argued for in uh, articulatory phonology and, and various uh, related frameworks. So I'll just um, quickly thank our collaborators and um, thank all of you. Terrific. Thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, I'll open the floor for questions, and again, you can uh, ask the question by, or identify yourself as asking a question by raising your hand or also pose uh, a question in the chat. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Doug Whalen. Please go ahead, Doug. Hey, Ryan, uh, fantastic stuff. Thanks so much. Um, I was, uh, uh, well, one thing I'll say is um, it seemed like your conclusion about the uh, illegal clusters was restricted to glottal stop rather than just illegal clusters in general, because you did have some illegal clusters that were pretty happy with the deletion. Um, but my question is on slide 55, I just wasn't sure what the alignment was for the signals. Uh, could you comment on that? You just mean like what the interval is that's being shown? Well, the, you had a temporal alignment and I wasn't sure what it was aligned to. Uh, let me reshare here. So you mean this plot? Yeah. Yeah, so all this is showing is it's from the um, beginning to the end of that CVC interval. Uh -huh. So what's not shown, for example, is you know the boundary between each of the two consonants. So there's, there's all sorts of other timing information that we would want to investigate here, I think. This is really, it's not, I'm not trying to make any particular claims about um, the relative timing of anything on the basis of this plot. Yeah. I'm just trying to show that within that interval, there's voicing is occurring basically. Yeah. 
That's that's really amazing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, now we have a question from Jason Shaw. Go ahead, Jason. Hey, Ryan. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Jason. Oh, uh, great talk. Um, I just uh, was thinking about the anti-OCP effects. Uh, more likely to get a vowel with the adjacent identical consonants. Yep. Um, I can see that as um, uh, obviously a phonological effect, but I think that there's also um, that could also be seen as a phonetic effect. I'm mm -hmm. trying to trying to remember where I think it's Marianne Walters dissertation. Uh, she showed that uh, I think she had an experiment showing that vowels um, are longer between uh, homorganic consonants. Um, uh, just in English, but it may be a general, uh, a general thing. So um, the anti-OCP could be seen as a phonological effect, but it could also be seen as a phonetic effect. Um, if you, uh, if it, so uh, if you think about um, kind of selecting and actuating consonant gestures, um, uh, once you, you know, that process has to be quick. So um, once you've produced a consonant, then you want to inhibit it right away, and then reactivating it has to maybe um, uh, kind of bounce back from that inhibition, which leads to these kinds of uh, tendencies for longer vocalic intervals between homoorganic consonants. So maybe there's a phonetic explanation for that as well. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll have to think that through a little bit more. I mean, I certainly have in mind um, suggestions by Gaffos and, and related work on you know, the potential relevance of a gestural OCP for determining phonotactic patterning in Moroccan Arabic and, and cases like this. Um, the other thing I will say that's sort of interesting about this is that it, it, um, it sort of has the hallmarks of an, an OT type process and in the sense that, it, that the avoidance of adjacent identical consonants shows a certain kind of non-uniformity. So for example, you can have adjacent identical Ts uh, if you add a prefixal T to a stem that begins in T. It's not categorically banned in the language. You don't necessarily get vowel appendices or anything to break up those clusters. But they do seem, it just seems to be one of these cases where you, you avoid them when possible, right? More important to avoid them than to delete or to, to have this pattern of gestural overlap. So there's some texture here uh, that should probably be investigated in a bit more detail. Yeah, that's right. And, and even the effect that I was talking about, um, I think it, it the the cause is is mysterious, <laughs> maybe as well. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you, though. That's I'll, I'll look into that. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, now we have a question from Meg Sikosh, uh, which is in the chat. Um, so she's also pointing to um, the plot on slide fifty-five, where there's substantial variability um, in the confidence interval ribbon in the voicing within the phonetic C clusters. Um, so she's wondering what could explain that token to token variability, especially since the data come from a single speaker, uh, lexical frequency effects or speaking weight. Um, yeah. Yeah, great question. So I can tell you one thing about this data, which is that it seems to be sensitive to the composition of the derived cluster. So if I can screen share something I haven't shown yet. Um, what we find, there are only three types of clusters in this data set. And what we find is that that kind of attenuated voicing occurs in derived kh and but not in derived uh, for reasons I don't entirely understand. It may have something to do with the fact that the cases where we find this covert voicing, you know, they both involve fricatives, perhaps that's relevant. Maybe there are aerodynamic factors at play here. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but there's certainly a pattern here that I think is worth investigating further, the extent to which this is really might, might actually be sensitive to finer grain distinctions and the kinds of uh, derived clusters that we're dealing with. I think the question about lexical frequency is a really interesting one. Um, my impression from doing field work on this language and from looking at our recordings, we have some other recordings, uh, EGG recordings that I just haven't fully analyzed yet. Um, I think there are some high frequency words that have probably been reanalyzed as just involving um, straight up consonant clusters without an underlying vowel for some speakers, but not others. So I think that the question of lexical frequency and the extent to which that could contribute to, I don't know, greater degrees or greater prevalence of um, gestural overlap versus perhaps you know, true deletion uh, or uh, any of the gradients um, 
outcomes in between those uh, would be really, really interesting to look at going forward. You know, as you can probably appreciate, these are hard questions to investigate in underdocumented languages where we don't necessarily have good corpora for really estimating um, frequency differences in a fine grained way, but we could probably start to approximate those questions at least. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Uh, maybe I can sneak in one last question <laughs> from uh, Maddie Gilbert of NYU, which came in the chat. Um, so the EEG study is based on the premise that voicing in the voiceless uh, C, uh, C context is a remnant of the deleted vowel. Um, so she's curious as to, as to whether the vowels in that position, uh, when they're present, are ever subject to devoicing, especially since um, you mentioned that they're often very short. Um, given that you define voicing as a remnant even in clusters with two voiceless consonants. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have not myself seen any devoicing in these environments. So you, you don't see these kind of intermediate outcomes where you get like, you know, something H like that has no voicing but form and structure that you, you could identify as corresponding to a vowel constriction. Um, you really, the, the, the presence of form and structure seems to correlate pretty closely with whether or not you have voicing. So I don't think I've, I've seen any kinds of vowel voicing in this environment. Um, perhaps that's telling us something. Um, you know, one thing that's been pointed out to me before, which I think is kind of an apt comparison, is the comparison between this process and high vowel devoicing in Japanese. So in Japanese, uh, between voiceless consonants, um, you, uh, high vowels devoice, which you might think of as um, the laryngeal gesture of the vowel being stripped away while the oral gesture is retained. Here, what it seems like we might be finding is the oral gesture losing out to the flanking consonants while the laryngeal gesture is retained. So if that's the right way of thinking about this, maybe that, that dominance or the resistance of the laryngeal gesture to its um, flanking environment might help us understand why we don't find devoicing even when we find a, a high degree of reduction. It's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I see actually a couple of questions which look maybe short-ish, so um, I'll go ahead and pose them. Um, one of them is from Ryan Lai, uh, where he has a clarification question. Um, when you say that it's phonologically controlled, what does that mean in terms of the gestural score? Yeah, that's a really good question, and that's something we're still trying to work out. Uh, I think one possibility that we're entertaining is that um, phasing relationships within the foot end up playing out differently from phasing relationships outside of the foot. So you might think of what's going on here is something like um, consonants in the weak member of the foot are being sort of drawn towards the accented syllable in a way that leads to greater overlap between the consonants and vowels in the unaccented member of the foot. So there's some adjustment or some deviation to the, the uh, default gestural score, I think that needs to get spelled out here to really understand uh, the fine details of the pattern, but uh, that's something that we're still working on, on kind of teasing apart the possibilities for. So it's, but it's, it's underspecified at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last question is from Sam Zukov, uh, who has a question about the foot-based analysis. Uh, do short vowels ever surface immediately before a penultimate stressed syllable? If not, we might be able to characterize it without feet as deletion of all pretonic short vowels. Um, so, so, um, just make sure, well, I'll, I'll try to answer this. I'm not entirely sure I understand. Um, so you only get pretonic deletion, which is a variable process when you have final stress. When you have penultimate stress, you don't get pretonic deletion. So I think that's really our key argument for uh, the foot-based foot analysis, that the locus of deletion is kind of inversely related to the position, position of stress. It's not additive. It's not like you get a new position targeted by deletion when stress shifts. It really flip flops in a way that suggests structure sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, that is the last talk of this session. So uh, please enjoy uh, the rest of the morning or afternoon, wherever you are, and then um, enjoy the rest of the conference. So thanks all for coming to this session and thanks to the speakers. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you, Charles. <laughs>